Welcome everyone to the recording of the presentation uh, called Estimating the Impact of DMPASC or Sayana Press Introduction. Um, this is a recording of a webinar that happened a few weeks ago, but sadly the recording was lost, so we are re-recording this webinar. Um, so for those of you who didn't attend the first webinar, um, this webinar is about the introduction of Sayana Press. Um, which is rapidly increasing access to one of the most popular uh, reversible family planning methods, being injectables. Um, simply uh, said, um, this webinar will help. Uh, this webinar will answer the questions under what programmatic circumstances will Sayana Press truly be a game changer? Um, and to help answer that question, Health Policy Plus has developed a model to project the potential contribution um, of Sayana Press to the National Family Planning Program. So um, we will we are joined today by Aaron McGinn from Palladium and Michelle Weinberger and Jim Rosen from Avenir Health, who will help go over the, uh, the, the presentation and over the different aspects of this model. Um, we will have a, a Q&A afterwards, not with people joining us, but based on questions we received during the webinar, after the webinar, uh, and that the presenters received throughout all of their presentations on this model. Um, so thank you again, <laughs> um, Aaron, Michelle, and Jim for joining us again. Um, I will give the word to you now. Thank you, David. This is Aaron again here. So I'm going to start first by um, just talking about why are we adding DMPASC to the Met National Family Planning Method mix. Well, DM, subcutaneous DMPA, or Cyanopress, as most of you know it by, is an in innovative new technology. We see that it's simpler and safer than the IM DMPA. It can increase user autonomy through self-injection. It can decrease operational costs, improve efficiencies and providers' time. We can expand access through community health workers and drug shops. And because it can be brought closer to clients, this can mean reduced opportunity costs for users. And recent new research from the US and Malawi is showing that self-injection is decreasing discontinuation rate. But while we recognize it has many game-changing qualities, HP Plus decided to apply its experience in policy and modeling to try to see if we could actually quantify how much of a game-changer DMPASC might be um, in a given context. So at first, we started with conceptualizing the actual pathways of change we might expect from introducing DMPA-SC. Since it's very similar to DMPA-IM, we assumed that the introduction into facilities where IM is already provided will yield minimal changes to the national FP program, that perhaps there might be some simplified logistics, possibly resulting in fewer stockouts or cost savings in transport or storage. And this is the flow on the top part of this pathway of change that you see. But if DMPA SC in combination with task sharing policies and total market approach expands availability of injectables through community health workers or drug shops, we saw this as expanding access and thus improving continuation and increasing first time FP use. There would also be a cost savings to the health system and possibly cost savings to the clients. This flow you see through the middle and lower ends of the pathway of change. So after we developed our theoretical pathway of change, we built an Excel-based model to try to quantify the programmatic impact and the cost implications of introducing um, introduction and scale up. We think this model can help answer several policy and programmatic questions. By how much will MCPR increase if we introduce DMPASC? Through which pathways might DMPASC be more or less likely to have an impact? Will DMPASC simplified logistics help boost MCPR? And what policy and programmatic changes are essential to, to achieve the impact we want? So our task was to take the 
framework that Aaron just showed and to start to quantify those different pathways to be able to look at the potential impact of different rollouts of DMPA SC on both method mix and the CPR. So the first pathway that we looked at was around expanding access. So this pathway tries to quantify the impact that expanding access to SC within a country will have on uptake of contraceptives. So we know from research done by John Ross and John Stover and other colleagues that there's an association between increasing the availability of methods and increasing contraceptive prevalence. Using the values derived from this research, the model quantifies the impact that DMPA-SC introduction will have on MCPR. This uses a very similar methodology to that used by the RHSC's reducing stockouts calculator. One important caveat to note is that the model only rewards impact from expanded access where DMPA-SC is provided through channels that did not already have IM being offered. So in the model, if you introduce DMPA-SC to a location where IM was previously offered, this won't produce any impact via the increased access pathway. So it's important to think about countries' current setup and how this pathway can best be utilized through task sharing and other such uh, interventions. Next. The next pathway that we looked at <clears throat> was around simplified logistics. As Aaron noted, the all-in-one feature of DMPA SC gives it a logistical advantage over IM, which requires two separate pieces, a syringe and a vial. We have some anecdotal evidence of a problem where facilities have IM in stock but don't have syringes, thus limiting a client's ability to receive IM. With SC, you eliminate this issue because of its all-in-one feature. However, our evidence in this area is pretty limited to be able to quantify the extent to which this is an issue and therefore the extent to which the rollout of SC will, will lead to fewer stockouts and thus more access to clients through this pathway. Therefore, this pathway, while in the model, still remains largely theoretical. Next. A third pathway is to look at reduced discontinuation. So we start here by looking at current discontinuation rates among IM for different users, or sorry, for different reasons, and think about where SC could lower these. The modeling is based on the assumption that a woman using DMPA SC will be less likely to discontinue it, to discontinue for two reasons. First, related to access. So a woman might have a reduced barrier in going back to the clinic if she self-injects or can get from a provider who resides closer to her than the clinic. And second, related to side effects. So we have some emerging evidence that show women report so fewer side effects when using SC versus IM. The model translates this lower discontinuation for these two reasons into a higher contraceptive prevalence. One limitation of the model is that we don't have great empirical data on the effect of DMPA-SC use on discontinuation. So while some recent studies are starting to provide more evidence in this area, we're still learning about this pathway. Finally, what we've talked about thus far has looked at the impact of DMPA-SC on changing the MCPR, so leading to increased contraceptive use through these pathways of access, simplified logistics, and reduced discontinuation. The model also looks at the shift uh, in method mix. So we know that women who are already using contraceptive methods might switch to DMPA-SC. So we have IM users who might switch to SC. This is largely determined by the type of rollout, whether there's a full switch out or side-by-side -side rollout. Um, and also based on where SC is being offered versus where IM is being offered. This has implications for costs, which my colleague John, Jim will talk about in a moment, um, but also can have some impact on MCPR via the discontinuation pathway discussed before. We also know that there's a possibility of women switching from other methods to DMPA SC. So again, this has cost implications. At this time, we haven't been able to model any impact on MCPR from this because we don't really have data to understand differences in discontinuation between what women might have been using before 
using SC and their discontinuation rates while using DMPA SC. Next slide, please. So to better understand the cost implications of the MPASC introduction, we wanted to include a broad range of both direct and indirect costs. We were particularly interested in understanding DMPASC's impact on client costs. That's because one of the selling points of the method is that it would save clients a lot of time and effort by reducing the distance between them and their point of supply. And through the self-injection option, by reducing the number of times a client would have to visit a health worker. Thus, the model includes things like the cost of the client's time spent traveling back and forth to a service delivery point, to a health facility, any associated transport costs, and their time spent at the facility waiting for and receiving the service. Next slide, please. So how do we calculate savings? How does the model calculate savings? The way we define savings was to calculate the entire national family planning program cost after adding DMPASC to the method mix, then compare that to what the program would have cost at the same level of modern contraceptive prevalence, but with the method mix we had at baseline before we added in DMPASC. So the difference in those two costs we defined as the savings. But we know that those savings don't come for free. There are significant costs associated with adding a method to the national program, any method, including for things like training of health workers, creating demand, making needed changes in policies. So the model estimates those introduction costs compares them to the savings and calculates return on investment. Next, please. These are just some examples of the various savings and return on investment calculations the models does, uh, calculates. It looks at total savings by year, savings by source of funds, so that's who pays, savings Per user as a percent of overall family planning spending, what the introduction costs are by year, and various return on investment calculations. So after we developed the model, we uh, tried two um, app country applications um, this past summer. The first was in Nigeria, where Palladium has a sister project, TSU project. Um, where it is supporting the Federal Ministry of Health with others to develop a cyanopress introduction and scale-up strategy. The Health Policy Plus introduced the DMPASC modeling activity as part of this strategy development process. Data from the model has been integrated into the strategy document. Our second country was Cameroon, where UNFPA is piloting cyanopress at just facilities in three districts. We partnered with them to organize a workshop in September with key national level stakeholders to apply this model to a country context. Since they are a little earlier in the cyanopress introduction process than Nigeria, the workshop served more as a springboard for discussing some key policy and program issues that stakeholders need to think about as they look to the future. So let's talk about the Nigeria application. What's their current context? In the year 2017, their current MCPR is 15, and their MCPR goal established a while back is 36% by 2018. Obviously, it's being revised. Um, DMPASC availability is limited um, in public and private facilities and concentrated in pilot and introduction states. DMPASC availability is limited at the community level junior community level workers and PPMV is a local term for a drug shop, cannot inject or sell. Social marketing of DMPASC occurs on a small scale. What is their vision for 2021? Well, the federal government will train family planning providers on DMPASC, including self-injection, 
across the 11 pilot states during the introduction period of 2016 to 2018. DMPASC will be scaled up to the subsequent 26 states through 2021. The federal government will train a share of these FP providers, and state governments are expected to train the remaining share of providers. The approved village health worker scheme will be implemented. CBD agents, known as community health influencers, promoters, and service personnel, or CHIPS, will serve as public sector community level providers of DMPASC. And the federal government will also train FP providers within the private sector on DMPASC, including self injection across the 11 introduction states. But similar to the public sector, DMPA will be scaled up, DMPASC will be scaled up through the private sector in the remaining 26 states through 2021. While the federal government will train a small share of these providers, the remaining will be trained by the private sector. A larger share of CBD agents, uh, such as uh, those run by DKT, will begin socially marketing DMPASC across communities. The task shifting policy that currently exists will be expanded so that pharmacies and PPNVs stock and administer DMPASC. So with this vision in mind, what does the model project with respect to DMPASC introduction impact? Well, first, the MCPR will, in, will be higher by about 1.2 percentage points. That is, if the current MCPR existing trend were to happen over the next five years without adding uh, DMPASC, the model pr predicts that the MCPR in 2021 would be 18.3. Whereas if, it, if they add DMPASC according to their vision, it will be 19.5. What are the pathways driving this boost? A huge portion of it, 66%, is going to be um, de delivered through private sector increased access. This is because they're envisioning a future in which the large number of pharmacies and PPMVs can legally sell and inject DMPASC or Cyanopress. A further 19% is going to be realized through simplified logistics because the future um, that's envisioned with, um, with DMPASC as a, a all-in-one package would help avert non-use of injectables due to stockouts or unaffordability of syringes. A further 10% is going to be realized through reduced discontinuation and 5% through increased public access. What about the use by source? Over 50% of DMPASC is going to be provided by PPMVs, with another 25% by public facilities and the remaining quarter through a variety of public and private service delivery points and public outreach. What are the net cost savings? Well, as one can, uh, can anticipate, the first two years would be in the red because of high upfront introduction costs. But thereafter, we do see a significant return on investment. In 2018, higher cost savings, because of the two-phased approach, the cost savings will dip in 2019, but then recover again. And over five years, it looks to be a 61% return on investment. Who is going to benefit the most from these cost savings? It's going to be clients overwhelmingly. Clients will benefit uh, due to their uh, reduced opportunity cost of client walk time and time spent at a service delivery point. So, how did this play this um, model uh, play out in Cameroon? Cameroon's context today: the modern CPR is 24 with their MCPR goal by 2020 of 30%. Almost all public hospitals and health centers do provide DMPA IM. About 10% of religious facilities offer IM, and other private sector offerings are quite negligible. Community health workers, known locally as ASCs, exist, but they don't provide IM. And about 7% of pharmacies sell IM. Cameroon's, visit, uh, Cameroon's vision by 2021 is that all public hospitals and health centers will provide SC. 20% of religious SDPs will offer SC. 50% of other private SDPs will offer SC. And at least 75% of community health workers 
will be allowed and able to provide a DMPASC, with 25% of pharmacies being able to sell it. So what do, if, we, if uh, Cameroon operationalizes this vi vision, what will they yield? About an extra percentage point in their MCPR. It's estimated that by 2021, its current status quo trend, they would have an MCPR of 24.8, but adding Sinopress with the, uh, through the vision that they in, um, anticipate, then it would uh, increase to 25.9%. What would be the pathways driving this boost? Well, contrary to Nigeria, in Cameroon, it would be the public sector. Why? Because existing community health workers would be allowed to provide injectables. That policy change and programmatic change would have a large impact. Another 32% uh, would be driven by reduced discontinuation, and 15% uh, by increased public sector, private sector access. Only 3% of the change would be as a result of simplified logistics in Cameroon. What about the use by source? It is a little bit more evenly distributed in Cameroon, estimating that public hospitals and public health centers uh, account for about 45% um, of, um, of the source of DMPASC with pharmacy and drug shops, another 30%. What about the annual net cost savings? Again, as with Nigeria, the first two years will be in the red due to startup costs and introduction costs, but again, a nice uh, increase of uh, cost savings over the remainder timeline, uh, representing a 163% five-year return on investment. Again, who is going to be uh, benefiting from these cost savings? Overwhelmingly clients. Um, again, reduced user fees and lower opportunity costs, client time, and travel expenses. So in summary, is Cyanopress Press going to be a game changer? Well, it depends on what is important to change. It is revolutionary for increasing women's contraceptive autonomy. But so far, modeling is not showing a huge impact on MCPR. But it does have an additive value. For instance, in Nigeria, the five-year MCPR will be 33% higher than business as usual. So that, it is, so that is positive. But it is important to have a realistic vision of what any FP intervention will accomplish. And this modeling helps us to do that. It's also important for stakeholders to really understand how important the accompanying policy and programmatic changes are like tax sharing and engaging the private sector pharmacies and drug shops. Countries will only see a bump from DMPA SC introduction if access to it exceeds baseline coverage of DMPA IM. So within this context of an optimistic current in our community that Cyanopress could indeed be a game changer, for us the question is not whether Cyanopress would be a game changer, but rather, but rather under what circumstances. Finally, we want to underscore that MCPR is not the only reason we exist. It's not the only outcome in which we can judge success. The model does show that other important aspects, like reduction and discontinuation, positive returns on investment within a couple of years, and significant reductions in out-of-pocket payments by clients who might be precisely the rural poor women we so often seek to reach. We're also excited about how DMPASC could engage the private sector more in family planning and shift some of the volume from public health facilities, hopefully allowing those public health facilities to devote more time to other FP interventions like long-acting and permanent methods. HP Plus would like to sincerely thank the model development team and those who helped with the country applications and further recognize that PATH and FHI 360 provided some valuable technical inputs during the model development process. If anyone has questions about this presentation or the model itself, please feel free to reach out to us at the um, contact information shown on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, Michelle, and Jim for that uh, lovely presentation again. <laughs> so we'll now I will post some questions that we received or during the webinar or after webinar. 
Um, so the first question is, um, does the model calculate for other impacts of increasing method availability, like reducing numbers of unintended pregnancies, reduced maternal morbidity, and mortality rates? So I think that's a question for you, Michelle. Yeah, so the model does not include these impacts because it's really focused on sort of understanding different ways of rolling out cyanopress and what the potential impact could be on MCPR. However, lots of models exist that, that do calculate these impacts, so things like impact now or FAM plan or reality check. And so the results that come out of a um, SC model application could be plugged into one of these models to look at the changes and these more downstream impacts uh, that would be had both in terms of the increase in CPR, but also from any shifts in method mix as well. Okay, thank you. So another question, um, what are your assumptions of country level coverage? So the model doesn't have any preset assumptions about the coverage of Cyana Press uh, in, I, I guess, either the baseline or the end line. So the idea is that in each country, that the baseline is tailored to the current situation. So in many countries, the current situation is that there is no coverage of Cyana Press. So in some countries, uh, initial pilots or some, some rollout has already started. So the baseline would be calibrated to match to that context. And the end line is really driven by discussions with partners in country about what plans are, um, or potentially through experimenting with different endline coverages and looking at the results to make some decisions about what the right coverage might look like. And the model, because it's accounting for these different channels of access, uh, the coverage is, is specified separately for each different uh, level of the healthcare system or channel. So you can look at the coverage in pharmacies separate from say the coverage by community health workers or health clinics. Okay, so another question for you. Um, does the model project, project beyond the five year mark? So right now the model is set up to only look at five years. Um, it was felt that this was a good time horizon for decision making and to have enough time to look at the, the impact of scale up plans. But maybe something in the future we could look at is being able to adapt the model to think about longer term time horizons. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is one for Jim. Um, can you el elaborate a little bit more on what is included in the costs to calculate savings? Uh, sure. As I uh, mentioned earlier, we wanted to capture uh, as many of the costs as possible, both direct and indirect. So direct costs uh, include client costs. And uh, as I mentioned, the client walk time is an important one. So that's the time that they spend walking to and from their uh, point of supply, the time they actually spent at the service delivery point, uh, both waiting for the service and being provided with the service. Any time they might spend in a vehicle going uh, to and from a facility and any kind of out-of-pocket out of uh, transport cost to pay for a bus or a taxi or something like that. Uh, that's it in terms of client costs. We also include the cost of the commodity itself and any associated supply chain costs for getting the commodity uh, from a central warehouse uh, out to the facility. We also include uh, the cost of the human resources uh, on the part of the health workers to provide the service. And, and then um, uh, all the indirect costs of things like uh, supervision, administration, and management. So all that goes into the cost, the uh, cost, and then savings calculation. Okay, thank you. Um, and does it also take into account um, other aspects like client education or policymaker sensitization? So that's a good question. Uh, those actually are, are not part of the savings calculation, but those go into the calculation of the introduction and scale up costs, um, which we then compare to the savings and do our, our return on investment analysis. So uh, anything having to do with um, uh, demand creation, including client education, 
uh, policy maker sensitization, all the different policy changes that have to take place uh, around task shifting or task sharing. That would all be included as part of the introduction costs. Okay, thank you. Um, and does the model take into account public sector versus private sector pricing? Um, for example, what would be the price points where, where, where it could be sustainable in the private sector? Um, what prices would women endure to go get it at a drugstore, uh, etc.? So those are those are great questions um, about the private sector role. The model doesn't really uh, get into that level of detail or try to answer those questions. What it does allow the uh, the uh, application user to do, however, is to set differential prices by different service delivery points. So you can have one price point in the public sector and another price point uh, in a pharmacy or drug shop or a private, private medical setting. Um, we don't yet have the capability in the model to be able to analyze, for example, uh, who is using DMPSA or who might use it by socioeconomic quintile, um, but it's also something that might be programmed into the model in the future to try to answer some of those questions. Um, does anybody have something to add to that question? Erin? Well, well, I would just add that, um, yeah, I mean, private sector introduction, uh, whether it's a uh, total for profit or social marketing, I mean, that, that's going to be, that's going to require a strategy development in and of itself with, um, looking at what, you know, what is the willingness to pay, you know, market segmentation, all of these elements that go into um, thinking through what the private sector, um, you know, what prices uh, women can bear there and who their markets will be. Um, if if the private sector, if, if the, that's not done in a thoughtful way, you know, in a way to, in a purposeful way to capture as much as the market as, as they um as they feasibly can if they overprice the method for instance and women uh, and they don't have any value added with respect to convenience or or some other uh, factor and the woman can get it in the private uh, public sector for free or, or lower cost um then then the private sector won't be successful in capturing the market that they that they want to um to capture and so the model is uh, to a certain extent assuming that there'll be some some uh, rational approach to if, if the if the stakeholders want the private sector to to increase its market share by 10 to 20 percent where the model currently is assuming that they're going to be able to do that in a way that you know in a, in a rational way that they can attract customers um, so that's that is uh, certain assumptions that are happening there okay thank you uh, and I thank and then I think there's a question that um, a lot of people will asking and are wondering about, is this model uh, in any way available already? Yeah, uh, so we're currently uh, finalizing the Excel model uh, to the extent we want. Uh, Jim and Michelle did mention how it could be built out further in the future, but at the moment we have a vision for uh, the, the version we want to release now. We're just finalizing that, and we're going to have an accompanying manual. But with the timeline to finalize these things and go through the print production process for the manual, will probably be something available in the next two to three months. Okay, thank you. That sounds really uh, great. Um, so I think that's it for the questions that I have. Um, is there anything else that one of one of you wants to add before we? close no i think that we've had a couple of people reach out uh independently online to raise some questions or issues or uh food for thought so we we have appreciated that and we encourage it so if other people are interested in this please feel free to reach out to us and um, we're happy to have uh, further conversations Okay, thank you. I think that people will definitely do that, even if it's just to have a, a discussion and share their thoughts on this. Um, so thank you again for um, having this presentation with us um, twice. And um, 
so I, I wish you all a good day and thank you very much. Um, this presentation will be made available on the RHSC website and we will also share the PowerPoint if that's uh, okay with you, Aaron. Yeah, well, thank you very much, David, for organizing this and to RHSC for hosting it. Yes, we are very gladly. <laughs> thank you very much and uh, enjoy your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.